I was sitting there weeping in my car. I was about 33 years old, had four kids, a mortgage, some investments, and uh, basically I'd just been thrown out of my job and I had to land somewhere. I was absolutely determined to go out on my own and to be never, ever dependent on a single source of income. And I guess I really learned that lesson about own the race course, which is control what you can. And I learned this from my grandfather when I was working with him. I was 20 years old in his uh, shed in the backyard. I was probably about 18, actually, 1989. And he was getting 3% brokerage every time he made a sale. And I thought, well, that's such a small percentage. Is it even worth it? But I tell you what, it is a great business model, especially as you scale. And if you're good, it's okay to get paid on performance. My business has changed a lot over the last 15 years since I've been online full time. In this video, I want to share with you some of the things that have changed and why they have changed. What my business used to look like in the beginning and what it looks like now, because I think there are some great lessons that might translate across and be helpful to others. In order to understand where my business is at now, we really need to wind the clock back. We need to go back a few years in fact, about four years before I quit my job. At that time, I was working for a psycho. I was running a Mercedes-Benz dealership, and this guy had an affection for General Patton, and he made me watch the Patton movie over and over again. And there's a particular scene in that movie where General Patton encounters his troops, and he used to lead from the front. He was a terrific general by all accounts. And they were all held up. They were actually stopped at a bridge and then backed up along the bank. And then they were getting shot at from the other side. And he said, what's going on here? He hops in his uh, Jeep, drives down the outside, goes down to the bridge. And on the bridge, he discovers there is a gypsy caravan and a couple of donkeys, and they're refusing to go anywhere of course, holding up all the troops. So he pulls out his pistol, shoots the donkey, and then encourages the troops to push the donkey off the bridge, and then they can move through. And of course, this is like an early version of theory of constraints. You find the bottleneck, you fix the bottleneck, and you move forward. Now, this lesson was drummed into me 20 years ago, and I can tell you it's become a really handy metaphor to deal with things that don't go perfectly. And if you have a business for any amount of time, you're going to encounter a few donkeys on the bridge, and sometimes that donkey is yourself. Right? You need to solve it quickly and move forward. At that time, we were doing around $2 million a week in revenue. So one other thing that I learned is when you're talking about Big revenue numbers, it can be deceptive. The average Mercedes-Benz car dealership in Australia makes around 1% to 2% profit. So what does that mean? It means if you were doing a, a $50 million a year business, you might be lucky to be making a couple of million dollars in profit. It's like that would be outrageously fortuitous. It used to blow my mind actually that there was all these people, all this land, all this stock, like $15 million worth of cars rolling around, $10 million worth of parts, all these people employed, like 70 people or 100 people, and yet there was very little left after everyone got paid. So I've always been a little more profit-focused than revenue-focused, but not in, t in terms of percentage because that's also deceptive. I know if you have a micro business and no employees, you're going to make a really big profit percentage, but you will be capped in terms of how much profit you can actually make. So I was actually paid pretty well for this job. I was getting paid a big salary, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And at the same time, I was heavily compromised. And this is one of the biggest lessons I've learned, compromise. Because there was a, a wild night uh, where my boss had been away for a while and unbeknownst to me, he'd been engaging in a, a bit of a battle with the other owner. And I was not involved in this, but for some reason, and, and he was you know, probably mentally ill, he got the feeling that I'd sided with the other person for some reason. And he got very drunk and he held up a knife at me and he threatened to stab me with it. And he said that I had to leave, I had to leave the job. He said that uh, I had too much talent. 
everybody liked me, they hated him, that I have to go, that I've sided with the other partner. It was all very awkward and uh, I remember being quite upset by it. So I did find a job across the road with BMW and it wasn't something I wanted to do. I'd been with the Mercedes-Benz brand from 1997 right through to 2004 by this stage and I'd come from BMW. So I rang up the guy in charge of Australia at Mercedes-Benz and I said, hey, I just want to let you know that I'm leaving the brand, not because I don't like the brand, it's because it's untainable where I'm employed. Now, my boss was well known by this stage to Mercedes-Benz. He had other issues. And a little bit later on from this, he actually punched uh, the state general manager in the head at an AMG VIP event and eventually lost his franchise. Uh, But that's a whole other story. The point is, in this case, the guy in charge of Australia, he said, don't go, please, just wait there. We will find you another job with the Mercedes-Benz network. We value you. And even if we send you out to head office for a while and just do nothing while we pay you, we will find you something. And I remember when he, when he hung up, I felt very emotional. I was sitting there weeping in my car. I was about 33 years old, had four kids, a mortgage, some investments, and uh, basically I'd just been thrown out of my job and I had to land somewhere. As it turns out, Mercedes-Benz found a job for me. They put me into a dealership to fix it up, to turn it around. That dealership was losing money when I started and it was making a decent profit when I finished four years later. In that four years, I was absolutely determined to go out on my own and to be never, ever dependent on a single source of income. I wanted to be paid by lots of people so that I could remove that compromise of being single source dependent And I guess I really learned that lesson about own the race course, which is control what you can. And I was in control of how I get paid and who I get paid by, as are most people. So these people who have a job who say, oh, it's so much safer than having a business. I don't think I agree with that because it wasn't so safe for me at that point. And I must say, I felt a lot more secure and in charge of my own destiny since I have my own business. I also think business is not for everybody. So I'm also not saying you should go uh, quit your job and and go into business. It really takes a certain mindset, but it's certainly one of the lessons I've learned. So I learned that I want to reduce compromise. I also learned that I want to control what I can. And I learned that with big revenue comes big complications. And it's very deliberate that over the years, I'd grown my business into a bigger business And then I sold off some of it and I've kept it at a pretty small business, relatively speaking, especially compared to a lot of the people you're watching on social media right now. And I'm okay with that because every time I'm coaching someone and they get a bigger, more complicated business, then it also comes with complexity and to some degree, a lot of compromise. Uh, So I like to celebrate a lack of drama and There was a point a few years after I quit my job in 2008, I'd quit my job where I actually exceeded the profit that the dealership was making with my own team. Uh, So let's have a look at what the business looked like in 2008 when I quit my job. I had a small agency, had a couple of recurring billing clients. I was very early into the local business marketing scene and I had information product. I had my cheat sheet that I was selling. And then I started selling some guides like uh, how to get better click-through rates on your ads, how to do better SEO. And I was an affiliate marketer. So I had a little guide on affiliate marketing and I was bringing in money from affiliate marketing, but it was pretty choppy, the affiliate marketing income. A lot of the things I was selling were one-time payments and some of them were CPA offers that would fade. And in one case, the client actually went broke. So they didn't pay me back, even though I had racked up uh, paid ads on my credit card. So I I knew I needed to make a change. So I sat down in 2009 and I wrote what was called the Mafia Plan. And if you were to look at that plan today, even in 2024, what you'll see is that it is still hyper current. I mean, I literally went and built that plan. And since July 2008, when I became independent from employment, I've never had a bad month or year, not once. And Of all the people I've coached, I rarely see that situation. So if you're looking for 
help from someone who understands how to mitigate risk and how to build a reliable recurring system, then that's what I'm good at. Because in 2009, I started my recurring subscription membership. And that recurring subscription membership is still around now. It's changed names and it's changed platform. But that is one thing I did from 2009 that I have continued to do with small changes along the way. I also started podcasting in 2009, which I still do to this day. And so those two things in combination meant that I didn't have to do a lot of other things. I could really reduce my dependency on paid traffic. I could reduce my dependency on affiliates. I could reduce my need to do all sorts of other tricky traffic things. And I didn't have to come up with new things all the time to sell because it's had the one thing to sell as that recurring subscription membership. And in my mafia plan, I put that at the center of the universe. And it cracks me up that uh, right now there are young kids who back in 2009, let's face it, some of them were probably six or seven years old, who were saying that recurring subscription memberships are the newest thing and they're brand new and they're amazing. And if they'd known that when they started their business two years ago, they would have done this model in the beginning. Well, guess what, guys? It's been around for a while. The other thing that's interesting is these people, are some of them have done it for less than 60 days. They've been in it for more than a month and they're now selling their how to make money with recurring subscriptions. Uh, and they're on track for 60 days to be earning X. So I'm thinking, well, gee, I've been doing it for 15 years. So I probably learned a, a few more tricks on things like uh, retention and onboarding members and so forth. The other thing is I started building a small team of Filipinos in my business to, to help me virtually assist. And I started running workshops and speaking from stage. That was my business model in 2009. But as the year rolled around to 2010, quite a lot of things changed. I added a high-level weekly call group, which is going to this day. And actually, that is really the strong product in my fleet. And if I could only have one product in my fleet of products, it will be that recurring subscription of the weekly call at a good price point. I've got the most incredible members in that and we meet every week and they get great results and so many people have come through that program in the years. Lots and lots of famous people from Pat Flynn through to Chandler Bolt through to Dan Corkle who just sold his business for $550 million, right? An amazing group. I've also had private clients. I had a few clients paying up to $10,000 a month for me to help them build their business and run their team I was spending about an hour a week on that program, but I wound that down a bit later as you'll discover. I had a couple of agencies now. I'd built an SEO business and a website development business all in, in 2010, and my team started expanding. In fact, I got it up to about 67 people, and we're pushing on the door of around $3 million revenue at a 50% profit margin at that time, and both of those agencies I, I kept for the next seven years. The high-level weekly call group I kept for another 14 years. It's still going. And the private clients, I still have six private clients. So that's still going too. And you can see there's a pattern here. Once you find something that works really well, you stick with it. You don't need all the other stuff. So soon making more profit than the car dealership, but a much simpler business. So I was doing it from home in my board shorts and I had a little distributed team overseas. So what have I changed and why? Well, I sold the agencies and there was a few reasons for that. One is for one of the agencies, I just hated it. <laughs> like website development, I could really see that it's getting commoditized and tough. And I coach a few people who do website development agencies and they're finding it brutal. And I tell you, I was so happy. It's right up there uh, with the birth of a child <laughs> or getting barreled on my surfboard. When I sold that business, it was great. And the guy that bought it, he was a client of mine. And he was a website developer and he couldn't believe that I was making more profit and working less than him and I don't even know how to build the website. He had no team and he was doing all the work and making about the same. I said, why don't you just buy my business then you'll get the whole team and then you can decide what you want to do or not. And he did and it went great. The other business was the SEO business and I sold that to one of my clients who was buying so much of the supply, it was starting to get risky. He could either go and set up his own and just stop buying, which would really sink the value of my business, or he could acquire the business, pay a fee for it, and then he gets a 50% discount on everything he purchased, which made sense, and he did that. It actually opened the door too later on because 
Um, one of my partnerships that I have now, and we'll talk about partnerships in a minute, is an SEO business. It's seoleverage.com. And I ended up with six or seven team members from the old business because the old business changed its marketing focus to just do more in-house and they didn't need some of the team members and they didn't need some of the, the clients. So I've ended up with the clients and the team members again. And that's been very strategic. So it worked out well. So what's happened, you know, in the years between 2010 and 2020, let's talk about that decade. Well, I stopped doing events that I was doing every year. Events were great for the membership, but I decided to wind down my efforts on the small membership a few years back. And in 2020, I decided this is the last event. And this was even before COVID, but I literally ran my event as America was shutting their border, as the Formula One Grand Prix got cancelled. It was around February, the or March the 13th, 2020. It was literally the last day we could have run a live event. And I haven't run that live event anymore. And I think I wanted to simplify the membership. I used to bring in experts, record it, put the content in, I'd market the event to attendees of my membership and then I'd market the membership to attendees of the event. It all worked really well hand in glove. But when I was analysing where my, my joy and my income come from, it's not so much the low membership level. It was more the higher level. That's where I wanted to focus. So I also rebranded from my business to my personal name and I did that because I realised I can't sell the membership. I tried to sell the membership many years ago, but the guy that was pretending to buy it, he just copied it instead. He saw what I was doing and thought, I'll just have a crack at that. He failed. He should have bought it. <laughs> uh, so I guess it was karma. But in the end, I decided to simplify my business and just focus more on that mentor level, which is what I did. But here's the interesting thing. The low-level membership is still there. Not only is it still there, but people keep rejoining. Every single month, someone joins who said, I was a member years ago, I shouldn't have left, or I'm, I love this. the people here, I like the once a month ask me anything training, I like the playbooks. So it, it is still a great membership. It's just simpler than it ever was. But that was also a big lesson. I had all these things and I was doing all this stuff that I thought was important, but it's actually not. So I also, in about 2014, I'd rolled all my information products into my membership and just made it simpler. And so there's a lot of trainings and live event recordings and all that for the lower tier. But here's the interesting thing. For the higher tier, I took all that stuff out. All they get is a weekly group call. They get a private chat with me and they get playbooks, which is my shortest condensed written version of how to do something, how to install something or how to do a sequence of frameworks, checklists, etc. That's it. Those three things. And I have the longest retention I've ever had for that program. And people stay for about seven years because it takes the pressure off having to market and having to sell, which is really the curse of a lot of online marketers. They're all obsessed with traffic, traffic, conversion, conversion. But you know what? Beyond traffic and conversion is just how about just looking after people really well and having the same clients over and over paying forever? because that's simplified. I stopped speaking. I didn't want to travel anymore. I've raised a family. I have a five-year-old daughter now, and I spend a lot more time with that. I've reduced my work hours back to about 10 hours a week. I closed my affiliate program because it was just hard work. Only so few people actually perform, and there's a lot of administration with it. I reduced my paid traffic to a, a really great evergreen campaign to sell my book, which I launched about 2016, I rebranded that personal brand because I think we're in the blue tick era. And let's face it, you can lend a lot of power to brands, but also something significant. In 2016, I started doing rev share deals, which is a royalty deal. So they started at zero then. They've been going for eight years and I started about 15 of those deals and I've ended up with eight that are keepers and that now generate more than half my income. And that's where I get a small percentage of somebody's business. This is a model I teach to my mentor members. And I love this model. I treat them like a regular mentor client, but I also host them on my podcast. You've probably heard them on my podcast if you listen to that. And every time they make a sale, I get a small royalty. And I learned this from my grandfather when I was working with him. When I was 20 years old in his shed in the backyard. I was probably 18 actually, 19 
89 and he was getting 3% brokerage every time he made a sale and I thought, well, that's such a small percentage. Is it even worth it? But I tell you what, it is a great business model, especially as you scale and if you're good, it's okay to get paid on performance. If that's something you're interested in, then I can teach you that. I also added a recruitment business because so many of my clients are like, James, where do you get all your people? How did you train them? It's like such a a black hole for people. And my wife is really, really good at finding Filipinos for my clients. So we set up visionfind.com. And I also built a surf brand, a personal surf brand, because I love surfing and I surf every day. And I also like testing out stuff. And right now, I'm pretty excited because I've had the last video that I made reached over 9,000 views and I only have 445 subscribers for that video. And the two before it each got 8,000 views. And back when that first one was made, I only had 70 subscribers. So I love the fact that I can create good, useful content for a completely different market. It's kind of challenging and fun to work in as a beginner in a, a new market and to bring skills to a fertile ground and to see it uh, spring forth a crop. Um, so I love the surf brand. I've been working with that surf brand for seven or eight years and I plan to sell that one day. So that's my monetization aspect. The The vision find will be sold one day. When each of my partners sell, I get a payout as well. So I can sell those. So I don't need to sell my membership and I probably couldn't anyway. And I just love focusing on taking my daughter to school and making her school lunch and watching her do art and swimming with her in the pool and uh, and you know she set up her little workstation here and likes to draw and do her alphabet and stuff it's it's pretty cool and so I'd, I've been doing a three-day work week for about eight years now and I think it's really interesting that so many people are obsessed with uh, hustle and grind stuff and you know when the four-hour work week came out that was interesting because there was a guy there you know young guy no kids saying work four hours a week I was like you're kidding mate and then now there's guys in crocs with flannos telling you and that you can, should work seven days a week you know not telling you you should but say, saying I work seven days a week I love it it's not work I love it but these people are so wrapped up their whole entity or, or their whole life is wrapped up in what they do they're, they're inseparable and I worry uh, for, it must be hard for exits but it's also not very realistic for anyone with kids. If you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, come on, what about for the normal people? <laughs> like it, it's such a different life. So I'm not knocking anyone else. I'm just saying that uh, I love the Viktor Frankl quote that in between stimulus, there is a gap before you have to respond. And I think a lot of the stimulus people have is wrong. And guys like Jay Shetty and Huberman or whatever, they're all getting cleaned up at the moment, you know, that people are pulling them apart, whether they've lied or they're not happy with some of the things they've done. You become a tall poppy, you, you might get cut down, it's true, but why are these people so focused on being big and famous? What's missing? We don't need to look outside for validation. You know what, I, I'm happy walking barefoot through the forest to, to go for a surf in the national park, in the surfing reserve and come back, I feel happy in that. I don't need to, to tell. I don't have a big social following. I don't share ever pictures of my kids. I don't brag or, or flex uh, or give tours of my house or show people my cars or wear a lot of bling and stuff. You know why? Because I don't need you to tell me that I'm awesome. I did when I was 20 and 30. I needed everyone else to make sure they knew that I was incredibly amazing but for whatever reason whether it's that I'm not competitive anymore it's just I don't care what other people think as much and also I can find that satisfaction within I know if I'm doing good work or not if I know if I'm having a good life or not and as I age you know into my 50s I'm more focused on strength and fitness and health and food and sleep I want a good sleep score on my aura ring I want a good readiness score I want to get in um, a good strength session. I actually only train two days a week for strength. And in six months, I've built four or five kilograms of lean muscle mass just from applying myself and doing it really well. And I get a lot of satisfaction from that, no matter what anyone else thinks. And, and I don't post pictures from the gym for everyone else to comment on. 
And like these young guys, like, oh, what colour should I paint my bathroom? Like, why would you put that on social media? Why don't you paint it whatever colour you want? It's your bathroom. Or hire a, a designer to come and show you. Like people who are too interactive with their life, I'm concerned about where do you draw the line? So what does it look like now in my business? I've been doing some things for 15 years, the podcast, the low ticket membership. The higher ticket or the medium ticket uh, has been for 14 years straight. <laughs> this is how you stack millions every year just by doing the same thing, right, and getting better and better at it. I've got private clients like Dan Corkill and, and Pat Flynn. I have a revenue shared deal portfolio, which is generating huge income, but also it's generating an asset sale value. Uh, so I'm super excited about that. I still have affiliate marketing incomes. I like that. My book is out there and helping people every day. I give it away and get, uh, I don't know, about 30 emails a day for a dollar each, thanks to Chris Benetti. My socials, I do post on socials, but it's leveraged. You know, we'll take snippets of videos. We'll summarize podcast guests. Um, and it's fine. I don't mind or, organic and content marketing with a bit of a boost of paid uh, my surf brand's going great. The recruitment business is flying. Every single month, it's just a wall of, of income coming that's been generated from previous efforts and focusing on keeping customers, just delivering what they paid for. So I do believe you can work about 10 hours a week and generate a seven-figure revenue and almost uh, or around seven-figure profit, depending on where that number sits. With a small team, you're not going to do it by yourself. You probably need three or four people. Some of the decisions that I've made, they usually boil down to a couple of things that I learned from the maniac, actually. Uh, one thing is, what's the point? I even have a post-it note. I won't do anything unless I know why I'm doing it. So I'm very uh, deliberate. And actually, that's been the formula for my YouTube videos. I had help from Zach Mason, but... We do one video at a time. We don't start the video unless we know what are we trying to achieve with this video? Who is watching the video? What do we want them to do after they watch this video? And then we script it out and then I record it and then we edit it. In the past, I would just shoot. But shooting is not smart unless you think about it first. Um, I ask myself, uh, what is the 80-20 of the 80-20 of this? Of course, the 64-4. I know that around 4% of the things, the inputs, the things I do will generate almost two-thirds of my result. And I found this to be true. Over the years, I've cut away all the stuff. You know, we pruned over a 1,000 pages off my website. We had 3,000 pages of which a 1,000 were doing nothing. No visits, no backlinks. Why even have them there? Get rid of them. Help Google know what my site's about. And I've pruned away all the bells and whistles and frills and unnecessary bits from my membership. We changed platform. Thanks to the magnificent click, KLEQ.com, I was able to move my membership to that and brand it on my personal name. And one huge difference, by the way, between click and all the popular platforms like school in particular is that you can still have your own domain controlling this. And it's not branded school everywhere, which is shit. Why would you do that? And it's not a make money by selling other people thing. It's just, hey, this is a really good platform for helping people and putting the things where you need it. So I've also over the years reduced my service debt. So I changed my contract terms from a year in some cases to 30 days for everything. So I'm only ever 30 days away from pulling up stumps. That's a cricket term and disappearing off the internet, right? If one day you go to my website and it says gone surfing, then you know I've retired, right, that, that I'm done. In fact, from this point on, it's optional anyway, but I do it because I still enjoy the money coming in. I can do things with that money. I like building out uh, property investments, et cetera, and while that money's coming in and, and joyful to get, I'll continue to do it. And that's another big lesson. You hear people saying, scale, scale, reinvest, reinvest, you know, put it all in, build it out to the moon. But I like to take my money out of the business. I pay my tax, fine. And I take it out of the business and I put almost all of it towards paying for a property portfolio and other investments because I'm now at the point where I don't have to do the work and 
I can live off the income that my money's bringing from going to work. So take some money out of your business if you can and put it to work because uh, one of the things when I diagnose people, they come in, I do a diagnostic and I analyze where they're at, almost always, almost always they're like a one for investments outside of the business. And that, that is compromise, back to compromise. If you want a no compromise situation, you need to not depend on your business. You need to be able to make decisions based on having time and options, not because you're forced to, you have a gun to the head or, you, or you're in an emergency. So the other questions I ask myself, what is the simplest version of this? What does the simplest version of this look like? Uh, the Occam's razor. And often it's just a minimum viable product. Do your research, get it right, and do it once. You know, like that uh, tradesman thing, measure twice, cut once. Do your planning, do your preparation, execute, and you're done. The other thing is what control can I have? That's why I really rather be able to point people to my own domain name because I can control that. I do not want to point people to someone else's URL. That's crazy. I do use social media, but I bring them back to my book or to my website. I can then, uh, once I've got the email, I've got a CSV file of emails that I can use on any email system if I want. That's my backup. Uh, So let's just have a look at the layers of redundancy here. At the top level, I don't even have to do work. After 30 days, I could advise everybody. We're finishing in 30 days. Everyone's happy. Stop. That's level one uh, and to be financially independent. Level two is that if something happens to any of my systems, I can point my domain somewhere else or I can send an email to people. Even if I lost my domain, I could at least email people, say, hey, I'm over here now. That is great. You must have an email list. I'm of that opinion for the people that I'm coaching at least. Then how I think about team, that's another one. I've had my full-time team for 14 years now, six of them in the team, and most of them have been with me for for 12 to 14 years and a couple 10 to 12. So that really is quite amazing when you think about it, especially that I actually never worked for anywhere more than four and a half years. That was the maximum I've worked for any one company. And so – Every single person in my team has worked for me twice as long as the longest I ever worked in another company. I want to be an employer of choice. We have a great bond. We have a fantastic relationship. My team do all the things that enhance and augment what I do. In terms of Westerners, occasionally we're going to need Westerners in there for design or SEO. We get Greg Merrilies to design our website. We get Get Malak from SEO Leverage to help us with our SEO plan. Uh, we get Zach Mason to tell me what videos to make. That's fine. We just plug them into our Slack and we work together as a hybrid team. That's the easiest way. We don't have a big team. We don't have CMOs, CFOs, operators, setters, closers, sales reps. All We don't need any of that with my model. It's such a simple model. Podcast, membership, partners. That's it. We do get help from others. And I'm absolutely a fan of paying for fractional services or consulting whenever you need something. Like pay someone by the hour if you can to tell you everything they know in an hour. That is very smart. Uh, in terms of how I think about products now, I think simple, less but better. I like that uh, Dita Rams saying, less but better. Uh, in terms of partners, I'm a big fan of the royalty model because it's snowballing. It's gone from zero eight years ago to a substantial income eight years down the track, and it's snowballing. I also think go to the, the mid or high tier first before you do low tier. I see a lot of people think, oh, I'll do a low tier membership. If you go back a year later, almost all of them are gone. The mentor level members and, and private members are really amazing clients and they pay well. And it's actually more joyful than the lowest tier, uh, which is really interesting. I don't do events anymore. I don't do free groups. The free group thing is is just noise. Uh, I don't have any paid f- fake social followers. That's why I don't have a lot of followers because almost everybody buys them. And you can see it when you look at their content. They have 640,000 followers, but they get like 200 people uh, look at their video. I don't have affiliates, don't do launches, I don't really speak anymore, I don't do any webinars. So you don't need to do a lot of these things if you you get 
the basic style. In terms of life, I, now it's really health, lifestyle, and at a certain point, having more money, like if I were to add five more million dollars, I don't think that would make my life happier or better than it is now. So I'm not going to compromise selling my weekend for consulting versus having a surf because what would be the point of that? Back to what's the point? I don't feel the need to document my life and share everything on socials because I'm not looking for external approval. Uh, So what would I suggest you do after uh, watching this? I would suggest to have a little review of how things are going. Where have you made complications? What is the donkey on the bridge that you need to deal with? And if you do want some help with it, and if you think that I might be the person to help you, I do invite you to join either of my memberships get to meet every single week and private chat back and forth because that's that's my whole job. That's what I do. I'm James Schramko. I hope you've enjoyed this. This is James Schramko. 